Officially, welcome to the community meeting for the Bluebird Solar Project. We thank you very much for joining us this evening. My name is Brendan Neal, and I will be moderating the community meeting this evening. During this meeting, we will provide a general overview of the proposed Bluebird Solar Project. Following the presentation, we will host a question and answer session. You can ask questions in person, over the phone, or using the web-based interface. For participants asking questions in person, you were asked to indicate whether or not you wanted to ask a question when you RSVP'd or when you arrived at the venue. You will be called on a first come, first serve basis. For participants who want to ask a question via phone, please press star three at any point during the presentation to be put in line to speak live during the meeting. Dial 833-946-1546 to join via phone. For participants who want to ask a question via web, please type your question or comment directly into the comment area of the web interface. Please join via phone at 833-946-1546 if you would like to ask your question live. We have a number of Bluebird Project team members joining us this evening, but at this time I'd like to welcome Ken Nichols, who will introduce this evening's agenda and provide the presentation. Ken? Thank you, Brennan, uh, and welcome everybody here in person and to those online as well. Uh, my name is Ken Nichols. I'm the developer of the Bluebird Solar Project. Um, and I wanted to first say, like, when it comes to this community meeting, I know this Klickitat County has been having uh, discussions about solar. This is this is a community meeting that is being held by Avangrid Renewables. So this isn't like a, a county meeting or a hearing. So it's somewhat informal, and we're here to pass on information and get your feedback and questions about the project. Um, I want to introduce uh, the team. Uh, we've got Kristen Goland. Uh, she's the permitting manager from Avangrid. Monique Weinholds, who is the lead uh, engineer on the project. Um, and of course, Brendan introduced himself. He's with a company called Tetra Tech. And you'll, you'll notice uh, we end up hiring consulting firms to do different studies. And Tetra Tech has been one of our key uh, consulting companies helping us out on this project. Um, this is the we're going to talk. The agenda for the meeting is to talk about a little, tell you about about our company, uh, tell you about what we've been doing already in Click Attack County. Uh, you might have heard our name already associated with wind projects, uh, and then we'll dive into the specifics of the Bluebird Solar Project as well. Well, there's our pictures, and thank you. Um, Avangrid. Um, Avangrid is uh, it's a it, Avangrid Renewables is a subsidiary of a, a Spanish company called Iberdrola. Um, we've worked in the U.S. since uh, 1995. We've got about 8,000 megawatts, or what they call gigawatts, of wind and solar generation across 22 states. Um, we, t as a developer, we tend we own and operate renewable projects. Um, some developers you might come across in the industry, develop projects, and then end up selling them to larger companies to, to operate. Well, we tend to be the owners and operators. So in, in fact, as, as in addition to developing, we might even buy smaller buy projects from companies and uh, take them to fruition, meaning construct and operate them. Um, the company is $38 billion in assets. And we have also, in addition to renewable and uh, independent power, we have utilities in the North we Northeast. Um, some interesting facts about the company in the Northwest. Like I said, the, we started in 1995. Well, it came uh, started out of Pacific Power or Pacific Corp. Um, back in the 90s, utilities were deregulating and they created Pacific Corp Power Marketing, which was an independent power producer, like a, a non-utility or uh, power producing company. And over time, it's, it's had a few different owners, like Scottish Power and um, Avangrid acquired them. Um, again, it's 8,000 megawatts of renewables in the US. We've got about 1,000 megawatts of permitted solar. Um, almost half of that is uh, solar, permitted solar is in the Northwest. Um, another interesting, besides operating the, the plants in the Northwest, our headquarters in Portland operates the entire US fleet of independent power. So that entire 8,000 megawatts is, is operated um, by uh, staff that are located in Portland, Oregon. 
Um, some other uh, interesting things about uh, the company is we, uh, we have got 1,300 megawatts of renewables in the Northwest. We uh, own and operate a gas plant out of Klamath Falls. Um, and uh, hydro, it's not that we own any dams per se, but we own hydropower capacity in the region. And uh, the other interesting thing is what's, we own and operate what's called a balancing authority. And a balancing authority and utility, it's kind of a utility jargon term, but essentially it's a utility. Um, usually it's like a service territory like a Vista or Puget Sound, and they're responsible for balancing, meaning the balancing the supply of power and the demand for power, right? Because that stuff has to balance, otherwise the system breaks down. So we have a, a balancing authority that operates on Bonneville's transmission system. We own transmission capacity. We've got, like I said, 1,300 megawatts, you know, 2,000 megawatts of power. And it allows us to serve our customers better by, by having this control of our balancing authority. So it gives us kind of an advantage when we're selling the output of projects like the Bluebird Solar Project. Um, history in Click Attack County. Like I mentioned, uh, you're probably familiar with the wind projects. Uh, uh, Juniper Canyon and Bighorn Wind are two projects that are south of, south, south of here. Um, and since, so since 2005, we've provided a $24 million in county tax revenue. Um, landowners, uh, they get lease payments, I'm sure you're aware. Um, the wind projects have 47 different landowners that are participating in the projects. Um, and there's a new project, solar project uh, called Lund Hill that maybe you're familiar with. And there's five different landowners in that project. Um, projects like this create thousands of construction jobs. Like right now, um, Lund Hill is busy in construction and you're seeing lots of um, construction jobs. Um, permanent jobs. You might even know some people that work for Avangrid living in this, at least certainly living around the Bickleton area. Um, there's a, I think there's about 47 uh, and different employees working at Bighorn and Juniper Canyon. And eventually you'll see operating staff at, at Lund Hill and the Bluebird project. And uh, the other interesting thing that I learned is that the training for these, the people that work on these projects, they call them like, they call them, you know, ener renewable energy techs, but they know about fixing wind turbines. In the case of solar, it's like running a solar plant. And the training for all of the techs in the country is done out of the Golden Dale warehouse. I don't know if you knew that. I just learned that this week. Um, so um, these techs, um, we, we, a lot of our parts are located in Goldendale for the wind turbines. And it's also a place where they perform the training. Uh, be, uh, benefits of solar energy. Um, certainly you guys have heard the, the talk. There's lots of solar going on around the country. This particular project, it's about 100 megawatts in size. Um, and just to give you in context, the Bighorn Wind Project is 250 megawatts. So what that means is at its maximum output, like a super sunny day, straight up noon, it's producing 100 megawatts of power. And it provides enough power for about 25,000 homes over the course of a year. Solar doesn't consume any water during a, a production. No odors, very little noise. Doesn't make, yeah. And it lets the soil rest if you're a farmer. At the end of this, and if it's decommissioned and taken away, your soil will be in great shape, ready for that next crop. Um, solar energy doesn't provide any toxins. There's no acid rain. And of course, you guys have heard about the topics around um, global warming or uh, greenhouse gases. Well, let's dive into Bluebird. So this this is a map of the project, and I'll first I'll just point out that the the dots on the the map. Uh, yellow, green, and blue represent the wind turbines that are here, that I just mentioned. Um, you can see Bickleton is just north of here. The project is located. Um, Bighorn Road is just on the eastern side of the project. And you can see, if you see Dot Road, is just to the west of the project. And it's between uh, Hooker Road and Van Ostern on the, on the south. Other things to point out here. Uh, the green shaded area on the in the southeast, that's the uh, fence line for the Lund Hill project. So you can see these projects are 
probably about a mile and a half apart from each other. Another interesting point is the purple dotted lines. So the purple dotted lines are, we call them gen ties, but essentially they're, they're transmission that's dedicated to getting the generation to the Bonneville uh, system. So uh, if you notice up there's a black box up there, it's called the Spring Creek Switchyard, which if you're driving on Bickleton Highway and you get to just past Cleveland, you'll start noticing these steel H-frame uh, transmission. Anyway, that's the Bighorn Gentile line that's taking the Bighorn wind output to the Bonneville uh, substation. I think Don Milner, who operates the Bighorn wind, knows all about that one, probably. Um, Juniper Canyon. Um, so the interesting thing, so Lund Hill is using the same Gentile, is using Juniper Canyon's Gentile to interconnect to and get to the Bonneville system. In the case of Bluebird, we're using the Bighorn Gentile line and interconnecting it to provide, uh, to get the solar out to the Bonneville system. Want to give you a sense of what, um, what a solar project looks like, just for those who haven't. This is not your, you know, it's not sitting on a, a building. It's not a fixed tilt where you might see it in the middle of a field. These um, are on posts that are probably six feet high and they run north south. And what you'll see is the, the panels actually sit on top like this, and they're on trackers. So in the morning, they're facing east. And during the course of the day, they rotate to follow the sun to get the maximum output from the sun. So this is a project in Oregon called uh, Y East. It's smaller. It's about a, about a 100-acre project. But you can just see the, see the panels sitting on those trackers, and it's just it's, uh, it's very flat. Another thing on this slide, again, we're, we're hoping um, through the permit process they'll begin construction at the end of 2022, and it'll take a year to a year and a half to construct. So best case scenario, it's, it's done by the end of 2023, just to give you a time frame. Um, a couple of specifics. This is kind of a, 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 a zoom in on the project. So there's some things to point out here. Um, the red box at the bottom is the Bighorn substation. And acreage wise, just to give you scale, the blue box is the area that we surveyed. Um, and then there's a black outline and you'll see some, some draws and some other, you know, that, and that area is about 1600 acres, the black area that we could actually construct in. Um, so the project at this point is, we're proposing it to be in the north, but, uh, we it, through the permit process, we're going to find out whether it belongs there or someplace else. So the layout might change, but this is our current estimate of where you might see these solar panels. And um, again, it's not defined yet, but we think we're going to need about 700 acres of fenced area in order to get 100 megawatts AC of solar. And I think what you find too, if it, just as a rule of thumb, when people talk about solar, you get about it takes about seven acres to get one megawatt of solar. And that changes based on the you know, geology, et cetera, but that's kind of a rule of thumb in the industry. Here's a couple of shots. Uh, the, the one in the top on uh, the Northwest section, that's, that road is Dot Road and it's looking out at the project. And you're also getting, and this is the one in the, the bottom right corner, that is off a of middle road. And one, of, one that we'll talk about a little bit or will come up later, but we actually do a view shed analysis. So we, we take pictures from different spots around the project and try to demonstrate what this might look like if you were sitting on Dot Road or if you were on a, in a car on Middle Road. Uh, construction. So one of the elements that we're, we're finding at Lund Hill is, uh, you guys are probably aware, but you have shallow bedrock up here. Have you noticed that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, which is, <laughs> that's, that's right. The bedrock is very thick. You just hit it. <laughs> Good point, sir. Uh, anyway, uh, so the construction techniques uh, here are much different than you might find in the middle of a cornfield in Iowa, for instance, right? So for our, our purposes, you know, we need to, we're going to be drilling. 
most likely, right? So there's like two pieces of equipment that are required. One, you go and drill a six inch hole, about six to seven feet deep. And then you, you take I-beams and come back with a hammer driver and you're hammering I-beams into this basalt. The good news, the good news here is you don't have to pour any concrete. And, and, and interesting, there's actually some rock that's, that will um, shatter. And so you end up having to come in afterward and, and pour concrete. So this basalt is actually creates enough friction so that it holds these piles in place well. So good news is no concrete. Bad news is, you know, you just spend more time drilling. Um, here's a look, a closer look at these, uh, what the trackers look like. And so you can see the piles on the bottom and what they call it a torque tube. The, the round thing that the panels are sitting on is called a torque tube. Um, and that's the panel sit on top of it and they rotate throughout the day. And this is called one in portrait, which means you've got one panel on top of the torque tube. And there's some designs that have two in portrait. So it'll be, uh, end up being a little bit taller, uh, configuration. Um, I think we're Monique one in portrait. Thank you. Anybody want to guess what this is? These are inverters. So as I mentioned, so the, well, I didn't mention it, solar works on direct current, DC, and you need to convert that from DC to AC um, to get it onto the transmission line. So in the project, the solar is uh, converted, it needs to take all the DC from the solar panels and the inverters convert that to about 34 and a half kV AC. And then you end up burying or putting above ground collection cables which end up going to the, the collector substation. At the collector substation, now you're bringing in all that uh, 34 and a half AC. Now it goes from that and it steps it up to 230 kV, which is the voltage of the Gentile line, which actually matches, happens to match the voltage at the Bonneville line. So anyway, there's a lot of voltage changes that goes from uh, the panel to, uh, to the Bonneville system. And I'm gonna let uh, Kristen talk about some of the surveys and studies that have been done. So. All right, so Monique and I are gonna tag team this. Um, I'm gonna talk first about some of the environmental surveys that we do. So uh, I'm a permit manager here at Avant Grid Renewables. I've been at Avant Grid for about 15 years. Um, and Monique will talk in a sec, and she is our project engineer. We're the folks that are behind the scenes of Ken, so you're going to mostly hear from Ken. Um, and Ken is the project lead, and then we're the support team behind him. So on the environmental side, um, uh, uh, for surveys for environmental and then technical, the reason we do these, there's a couple. One is that we want to refine a project layout. We want to find a layout that's the least impactful, is also the least cost to build. Um, and so we're going to want to do studies, whether they're the environmental or the technical studies, to try to figure out, all right, what's the best place to put this project? The other component of it is, as you guys probably know, the county goes through an environmental analysis, and these studies feed into the environmental analysis as well, and they, they talk about what's happening on the site. So a couple of things that we've been working on behind the scenes for the last year. Um, one is habitat and rare plant surveys. We've had a team that went out. Um, most of this work was done last year and they finished up a little bit of cleanup this year. And what they do is they go out and they survey the entire footprint of the project. So in the map that Ken showed earlier, that, that larger box area um, has been surveyed. There was a little cutout of a draw. We know we're not going to put solar panels in a draw, so there's no point in surveying that. So we did our um, surveys for habitat and rare plant and those are complete. We've also done our jurisdictional water surveys and that's jurisdictional for both federal and state waters. We also have general wildlife surveys that we've done on site. One of the benefits of this project, as well as the Land Hill project that Ken had mentioned, is we have existing wind projects out here, our bighorn projects on this side of the canyon. So we have a lot of wildlife data. Um, so we have all of our pre-construction surveys from the bighorn project, uh, as well as our operational um, uh, reports from the uh, bighorn project. And that feeds into the wildlife surveys we have here. In addition, anytime we have biologists go out on site for any of these surveys, they're collecting incidental information and that feeds into those. We've also completed uh, cultural surveys for the site. Those were completed this year. Um, that involves a uh, database search for DAHP. It involves pedestrian transect surveys on the site. And then in some instances, there will be shovel probes 
to look for subsurface um, and all of that's being compiled. Ken had mentioned uh, a little bit about visual simulations. We have gone out uh, and taken uh, pictures from uh, public areas around the site. When we do visual simulations, similar to if you recall some of the wind projects, we want to do them from public vantage points where the public's going to be able to view them. So we have the key observation points, which is what I've called the, the whole suite of pictures that we've taken around the project area. And as Monique's team starts to uh, hone in a little bit more on what the layout's going to be and how that's going to be analyzed in the draft environmental impact statement, we'll then um, decide where are those areas that we're going to do the photo simulations for. So most of that's getting wrapped up right now um, on the environmental side. And Monique, I think you're going to talk about some of the technical. Thank you, Kristen. My name is Monique Weinholz, and I'm the technical lead during this development process for Bluebird. Um, I've been actually with Avangrid for about three years, and I have been working in solar since about 2011. Love it. Um, what I wanted to do is just kind of tell you what we've been doing in terms of our um, technical definition or our design. We are now, um, since Kristen and, and her teams have done such a great job with um, getting all the you know, information that feeds into the design, as Kristen mentioned, um, we have a really good idea in terms of any wetland areas or cultural areas that we need to kind of avoid. Um, Um, and so we are now knee deep into our um, really defining our design for our project and we're working through that. We should be um, completing a certain level of design later this summer um, and then that's going to feed into us uh, being able to do our glint and glare analysis. Let me just back up one, one other thing. We have already completed our geotech. We've done a final geotech throughout the site. And um, as uh, Ken mentioned, lots of rock around there. <laughs> but that, that helps us uh, really define um, our design for our, our, our piles or piers, which is where our racking system um, is attached to. And I think Ken did a great job describing kind of high level what we anticipate that installation process is, is going to look like. Um, so once we get to a point where we can really um, define our layout, um, which will probably be early July, we will start working on our glint and glare anal analysis. And that is going to be from various viewpoints around the site. Um, so that will be coming out later this summer. Um, some of the other um, areas that we're going to be going through are um, we are in the process of looking at all the different haul routes. Those are the um, exterior access routes to get to our site during construction and then during operation. Obviously, it's going to be a lot less of folks. And um, Ken already mentioned, you know, construction could be uh, up to 18 months, um, but there might be some time periods where maybe the weather is not as, as good. So um, that's why we say up to about 18 months or so. Uh, and so during that process, we're defining what that um, traffic study is going to look like. And, and really defining the best routes to, to get to site. So we will uh, be including that in our environmental um, permitting process. And that's also going to inform us in terms of setting up our road use agreement. Um, we are already having discussions with Clicky Tack County um, in order to adhere to all their requirements, because obviously after we do our, our road, um, road studies and our traffic studies, we need to do some geotech work per county requirements to see what sort of upgrades will be required because there will, will likely be some um, in terms of making sure the roads meet, meet the requirements. So that's kind of um, the, the long haul process. And um, Kristen, I think it's back to you, or Ken, it's back to you. Yeah, that was good. Um, thanks, Monique. Yeah, and I'll, I, I can even transition a little bit. Um, she mentioned she mentioned roads. One of the par part of what we've done so far is uh, agency outreach. So Kristen and I have been talking to the planning department just to let them know about this project, and they've brought in certain parts 
of the county. So for instance, um, fire chief, um, John Jensen is the fire district chief. I've talked to him. Um, emergency management is Jeff King. Uh, public works department, that's Gordon Kelsey. So we've had these convers some conversations already, so they know what's going on. And as Monique mentioned, back to roads, we have a sense of, you know, a couple of different routes that we're considering and what is it, you know, what's important to the county as far as improving those roads and the designs associated with that. Uh, including in that is the building department. Um, it's Lynn Ward. You guys know her. Um, so we've been, we've had these beginnings, but again, it's just beginnings, right? So part of what we're doing is to try to create this application and this draft environmental impact statement that addresses the concerns of these particular parts of the county. Um, in addition to that, we're looking at state agencies like the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Kristen and company uh, Tetra Tech is a supporting in that, and they've been talking to them about what our survey's finding um, and getting, ad addressing some information and, and what are the concerns that they have. In, in general, they're, yeah, I guess they're, they're worried about sage and shrub step and things like that, habitat for the for wildlife. Um, uh, Krista mentioned DAHP. I don't know if you guys know what the, but here it is, Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. That tends to be, um, we're looking at cultural um, sites or looking, surveying for certain uh, things related to Native, Native Americans. Or in some case, it could be even pioneer um, findings like um, old, uh, um, uh, yeah, pioneers that were in the area. Um, we've had some outreach with the uh, Indian nations, the Yakima and the Warm Springs Indian Nation. I see uh, Elaine Harvey uh, is is, uh, is here in the crowd. Um, I've, I've happened to talk to her a couple of times about the concerns of the Yakima. Um, but at this point, we're at the stage of to let them know what we've discovered through these surveys, and this is part of our outreach for the project. Let's see what's next. Oh, I'm going to let you take this. Um, and, and just to kind of, of dovetail off of that with Ken, so everything is informal to date. We are, we are not the county. This isn't a public hearing. Um, all of the outreach has been um, because, because we want to do it. We want to have a good project. We want to have an appropriately cited project. And it's just something that we do as a company. And for those of you who have, have worked with us before on our wind projects, you'll know that this is nothing out of the ordinary. Um, so kind of dovetailing into what the permitting process is. So we did submit um, a formal application to Click Attack County. Um, that was submitted last month. Um, knock on wood, we should be deemed complete, hopefully this week. Um, once we're deemed complete, the county issues a notice of preparation, and that notice of preparation uh, has a scoping comment period associated with it. In that period, the county wants to hear from you. They want to hear about what are the concerns you have with the project, what is it that you want to see in, um, analyzed in the DEIS, and that's your time to really host all of your questions to the county. There'll be many more opportunities and I'll kind of go through what those were, but that's, that's really your first one um, is after the notice of preparation goes out and the scope and comment period is open from the county. Once that closes, all that information, all the questions from you, all the studies from Monique and I, that goes into the preparation of the DEIS, the Draft Environmental Impact Statement. And what that does, um, that's gonna be the culmination of the impacts of this project. We anticipate, it's on the county schedule, but we anticipate that that would come out sometime in the fall of this year. Once that gets released, the county will issue it and they will also open it up for public comment. So that's another opportunity to comment and that's specific to the project. Um, what do you think about the draft environmental impact statement? What do you think about the impacts of the project? All those comments get collected and then in the preparation of the final environmental impact statement, that's when the response to comments comes in. So there will be a very specific response to comments as part of the FEIS and any changes to that environmental impact statement that will be included at that point. Once that FEIS comes out, then the, the county will issue their SEPA determination. There'll be an appeal period. Once that appeal period is expired, then the county can issue their um, EOZ permit, the energy overlay zone permit. This project is 100% in the energy overlay zone. Once we get that EOZ permit, we're certainly not done. Um, there are 
compliance filings that need to occur. So I call this kind of my pre-construction work period. We have our permit that allows us to construct, but there's usually conditions that say, hey, but you have to finish your road haul agreement, um, submit unanticipated discoveries plans, um, submit weed abatement, reg uh, revegetation plans. While we're doing all of that, we will also have contractors that will be going for our construction permits and our building permits with the county. Once we receive those, then we can start constructing the project. We've anticipated it can last up to 18 months. And as Monique had said, that's really because we kind of want to avoid um, uh, the mud season. Plus, we also have unforeseen events that can happen. The weather happens, um, supply chain issues happen. And so we want to leave the maximum extent possible. We anticipate that this project will be coming online at the end of 2023, as Ken, uh, uh, Ken noted. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to uh, Brendan. But before I do, um, just as I noted, this is not meant to be a hearing. Um, we may not have all of the answers. We're here to answer as many as we can about solar. We've committed to, we'll commit to you that if we don't have an answer, we're just going to take it back and say, we're going to have to get back to you. I mean, we're all, you know, Monique and I and Ken, we're all respective subject matter experts, but there's only so much we can retain in our head. So we will do our best to answer questions. Um, more specific questions about the project, we may end up punting because we don't know the answer yet. The DEIS hasn't been written um, and we don't necessarily have all of the answers for the project. As I said, studies are, studies are underway and engineering is happening right now, but we will do our best. We've committed to get, um, to get any responses back to you that we cannot answer today. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Brendan so we can start the Q&A. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, for the informative presentation, and thank you, team. We really appreciate it. Uh, we will now begin the question and answer session. You can ask questions in person, over the phone, or using our web-based interface. For participants asking questions in person, you were asked to indicate whether or not you wanted to ask a question when you RSVP'd or arrived at the venue. You will be called on a first-come, first-served basis. For participants who want to ask a question via phone, please press star three during the presentation to be put in line to speak during the live meeting. Dial 833-946-156 to join via phone. For participants who want to ask a question via web, please type your question or comment directly into the comment area of the web interface. Please join via 833-946-1546 on the phone if you would like to ask your question live during the presentation. If you are speaking live via phone and watching online, please be sure to mute your computer speakers while you are speaking to prevent audio feedback. Now, our first speaker this evening, uh, Mr. Lawrence Goodnight, if you wouldn't mind approaching the microphone and uh, sharing your comment. Lawrence Goodnight, did I get the name wrong? Ah, I'm sorry about that, sir. I saw the checkbox here. Uh, we would, would. When they drill the hole, what do they do with golf balls that comes out of it? Now we're drilling the hole slightly smaller than the diameter of the, the estimated pile that's going to be driven. Right. And so um, we are keeping all the tailings that come out of the hole. And once they've, they've drilled, um, They've drilled that hole, they put it right back in again, and we're only losing about 5% of that you know, to, to the atmosphere. So that's a pretty good recovery rate. And that we've, um, you know, I think Ken mentioned this earlier, we've, we've noticed that uh, if we do it in that method, I would say the, le the vast majority of the, the piers can just be um, yeah, you know, hammer I'm driven. I'm a farmer and dig a post hole. It yeah, work pretty good. Yeah, it works. It works pretty good, and it holds. And sometimes you have a quirky one here that pops up that comes right out again, and then yeah. we have to make a plan. But that's really, right. that's that's really well, our technique. My concern was that if you ever wanted to take it all apart, how much stuff would? If you had a lot of rock laying around, it'd be a disadvantage to farm it or something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, good question. Thank you, sir.
So that was the only question that we received from the audience in terms of uh, information that they wanted to share beforehand. Was there anyone in the audience who wanted to speak? Please come up to the microphone, sir. <laughs> yeah, in 1995, you said you were, that you were affiliated with Pacificor. That's uh, correct. Is Avangrid owned by Pacificor? No connection Do they whatsoever. They have any connection? No with connection Warren whatsoever Buffett? at this point. Okay. None. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh, we have uh, 15 people online at the moment. Would you like to step up to the microphone? Good evening. My name is Elaine Harvey, and I come from the Rock Creek Band of the Comispo Band here. And I have relatives who are from the Powan Put Band, which is from Pine Creek. And when the Lund Hill project was constructed, um, the, the Pine Creek Band wasn't notified. They didn't know of the project. And they have the village there. And they still have, you know, land there. And they're, they're also a stakeholder. <clears throat> and so hopefully, you know, you guys are going to get hold of the Pine Creek Band because this project is in the vicinity of the Pine Creek and the Rock Creek Bands. And also, I'm a fish biologist for the Yakima Nation. And I've been monitoring um, the fish populations in Rock Creek, Wood Creek, and Pine Creek. And I have a concern about water and how much water is going to be required for this project. Because I've read reports already of the amount of water needed for Lund Hill. And if you have two projects going on at the same time, and you're drilling or you're getting water from wells that are linked to groundwater, that feeds Pine Creek and Wood Creek, then you're impacting the fish in those creeks. And there are anadromous salmon. There are listed steelhead in those creeks. They've been documented. They're, they're in the NOAA fisheries documents, recovery plans. And I've been working in these three watersheds. And I know that these watersheds are intermittent. They're not perennial streams. And the fish that are there will die if there isn't water in the creek. And I have a concern because our, our bands, we're from here. We still go to these creeks. We still fish. Even the resident fish are, fish are important to us, as well as the salmonids and the steelhead. And these are concerns that we have from these bands because our people's been here. We're the first ones here. We still travel up and down this river, Columbia River and all the tributaries. We still gather our foods. And we never move to the reservation. We live in Golendale. We live all in this whole area. But we're feeling the impacts of green energy, solar, wind, and now the water pump storage. So there's cumulative impacts that these green energy projects are having on us. And we have treaty rights. We retained treaty rights from 1855 to fish, hunt, and gather. And we can't do that when there's a solar project on 500 acres of DNR land. We have rights to federal and state land, open and unclaimed. We have rights to gather there. And when you guys are going to put solar panels on DNR land, that impedes and fringes on our treaty rights. When you're going to suck water dry from the creek, kill all the fish, that's impeding our treaty rights to fish for those resources that are chiefs signed the treaty for us, the descendants. You know, we're from here. We're going to live here forever. We're going to live with the impacts that you guys are creating with these solar projects, with the wind projects, and the water pump storage. You guys can move. You guys don't, you cannot hear. Our roots are here. And what are our roots? Is our ancestors in the ground. Those are our roots. 
You guys do not, you guys aren't feeling the impacts that we have. We have tribal lands here. My grandmother's land is here yet. My grandfather's. And I see these arrows on the road. Now I'm worried. Are they going to put solar next to my grandma's land? Will we gather our roots? That's my concern. Our cultural resources, our fish, our wildlife, and all the cumulative impacts these green energy projects are having. And I wanted to let this, the Bickleton community know we're still here. We didn't go. We're still here. We have a longhouse at Rock Creek. We go there. The food we gather from this land here in Bickleton, in Goldendale, everywhere, we use at Rock Creek for our ceremonies. We're not going to go anywhere, but we have to live with everybody's decisions to put solar on their land, to dry out the creeks and kill the fish, kill the eagles with all this wind. So those are my concerns I'm bringing, and I wanted to share these words so that the community here can know we're still here, and we're feeling the impacts, and so is the wildlife, so are the fish. And our future generations of, uh, for, of us, we're going to, you know, they're going to feel it too. Because these are 40-year leases. I don't know if I'll be here in 40 years. But my daughter and my son, my grandkids, you know, they're losing out too. So that's what I want to share today. Thanks, Elaine. Did anyone else want to share a question or comment this evening? Great. Well, uh, we, we do not have any additional questions or comments in the queue at this time, though we will give it about five minutes just to give people a chance to uh, ask any additional questions either through the web interface or on the phone. Uh, but at that time, we will, we will conclude our meeting. So uh, at this time, we'll just give it, like I said, a little bit, give people a chance, and then, then we'll move forward from there. Folks, we, uh, we do have one more question or comment coming from a person who has joined us on the phone. Uh, Ms. Garland, I'm going to put you live and uh, you can share your comments uh, with the group. I apologize, just one moment. <laughs> Okay, our call comes from uh, Mr. Delmer Eldred. Uh, you are now live. Uh, please share your comments at your convenience. Well, I was just uh, curious what the attraction 
is in the uh, develop in solar in Klickitat County when there's more advantageous regions to uh, place it in the state of Washington. And also, what's the, uh, uh, you, you, why does it have to always be in an agricultural residential area? So uh, just, just to clarify, your question is, what is the attraction of bringing solar here when there are more advantageous places in the state? And why is it always being placed in agricultural residential areas? Is that correct? Yes, I got about 12 more, but we'll stop there. <laughs> Uh, if, if I if I think I heard the question correctly, is 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 did we choose this location? Um, uh, as mentioned, well, Ken can okay. go into this, but um, uh, as mentioned, we do have existing wind facilities in this. Um, we have existing infrastructure, as Ken had talked about. So we have the opportunity to place a solar facility with the least amount of impacts because the infrastructure is already here. Secondly, the county has established an energy overlay zone, and that energy overlay zone allows for renewable energy. And in fact, it, it welcomes renewable energy. And so as a result, you look at those two factors, you have a, a community, a portion of a community that the community has decided this is where they want renewables, in addition to existing infrastructure and known infrastructure to our company that we can benefit from, and that makes the site an ideal location for a solar facility. Ken, do you have anything else? Well, um, you, have, you have uh, about residential. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. You, you have numerous uh, areas along Highway 14 and Columbia River, which would be more advantageous for solar. You've got the reflection of the river and all you all there is is rock hills and it wouldn't uh affect any beauty or anything of the of the or the take from the integrity of the county which uh what you're doing now is taking the beauty and the natural resources and destroying them basically well what here one thing i will add uh, as far as why this why this site and Kristen uh, reflected it but it's because we've got these existing transmission facilities in capacity and to well, there's, there's, you have it you, you have it along you have it along the river down there too you have the same thing yeah um yeah well to be honest so those are bonneville lines right in fact if you drive highway 14 there's three of them um, but to build a new substation and to interconnect to Bonneville on those three lines is, I'm going to venture to say, a $30 million prospect. And that's $30 million that we don't have to spend on this project. Who built, who built, who built the substations that we have now? So the, uh, we did. Yeah. Avangrad built the substation? Say again? Yeah, that's 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 right, and and so I guess the the benefit of this project or the why it's this site was selected is we have the capacity and the system to 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 use it, and we don't have to build you know, that new uh, substation or that switchyard. So that's the, that's that's the main reason that it's here. Um, this is Monique. I just wanted to add a little bit more. Um, you. Another reason why it's a pretty good site for solar is it's relatively flat. And if you're looking at a lot of the um, areas just right near the, the gorge, um, there's a lot of topography there that's not ideal for solar. Um, in addition, well, you're, another... You're... Sorry, go the ahead. The slope is pointed... The slope, the slope on the, along the Columbia River is southward direction which you can't get any better than that well that is a good point however um, when we look at our um, meteorology assessment um, we actually get a better performance by utilizing the single axis trackers which is what Ken was talking about versus what you're suggesting which would be a fixed tilt that would be you know constantly facing south um, 
So, and it's also, well, it's pretty hard to build on the side of, of, of some of these hills. So there, there were some, you know, there's some constraints um, that were considered. And um, for us, it's just a better overall project on a utility scale to use a nice flat, relatively flat piece of land. And we have a, you know, a more efficient system um, when we do that type of construction. Well, I, I've lived in, around this area for about 48 years, and it can be very cloudy and fixed. And, and you drive down the river, and it's a nice sunny day. So you get you get more days of sunshine the closer you get to the river. That, that's actually really interesting because I've heard just the opposite. You know, you get kind of a um, I don't know, kind of a marine layer, but um, and actually there is an interesting fact that uh, I'll share that's relevant here, but. Uh, solar, if you if, if you took a solar project and put it in Helena, Montana, or Jacksonville, Florida, which would be your better solar project? Any guesses? Helena, Montana. Why? If it's sunny in Jacksonville, Florida, humidity. So the actual humidity in the air actually cuts back on the solar uh, intake. So, but anyway, I, I uh, and the okay. heat. Okay. Anyway, right. sorry about. We could go on for a long time, but I'll. I let guess we go. can debate the solar resource on the river or off. Well, thank you for your time, Mr. Eldred. We appreciate your comment and your question. Did uh, anyone else in the audience have anything they'd like to share? All right, seeing none. Yes, please, sir. Come up to the microphone. How much battery storage will be at these facilities? Lithium ion battery storage, ESS building. Yeah, this Bluebird is not going to have any lithium batteries. Montill either? Not that I know of. Correct. Correct. We don't have, there's no battery storage associated with these two. That's the future for solar is to have lithium ion battery storage to make it efficient and profitable. So why aren't you doing that? Um, it's still pretty expensive. Um, and the other thing is the Northwest. Um, so the reason you put batteries is what's called capacity, right? Is that ability to, to uh, have power when you need it, right? Because wind and solar is not necessarily when you need it. So storage provides that capacity. And we've got 60% of our energy in the Northwest that comes from hydro. And hydro has this ability to store, in, in, in essence. So most likely, and you're right, like if you read about solar and storage across the country, it's getting a lot of press. And I agree that in some places where you don't have this hydro capacity, like the Southwest or California, you're, gonna, you're probably likely to see storage happen there before you see it up here. So when the sun's shining and the grid's full, what do you do with your electricity? You can't store it, what happens to it? They shut off a nuclear plant or a coal fire plant yeah. to accommodate your inter intermittency. Yeah, so um, right now, so hydro. So has that the, stresses the grid. So, so hydro, hydro has the ability to fluctuate, right? Meaning, um, and you also have gas plants that have the ability to fluctuate their their supply. So you, we mentioned the ba you know this balancing authority that discussion. So you're right. When you've got a lot of wind and a lot of solar, everything else is off, right? You're you're probably not putting more water through the turbines. You've probably got all your gas plants off. I think uh, generally nuclear uh, and coal doesn't have that ability to fluctuate as much, but hydro and gas does. And so a lot of people think, oh, the future is to have a lot of natural gas to accommodate but a, a lot of, but right now there's a kind of a cost uh and carbon if you will or cost and emissions uh debate going on whether you want to build gas plants to balance this or use lithium on storage well the gas plant in goldendale is 277 megawatts and it can produce that night or day rain or shine that's a, yep, that's exactly right and so what they're what you're seeing is this ability to cycle a gas plant, you know, to 
that's true. But when you do that, that's what causes the pollutants and creates the CO2 and, and harms the environment when you cycle the other facilities on and off yeah, there's, because of the intermittency of wind and solar. Yeah, interesting. If we want to have a debate about gas, uh, we could do that. But um, there, there's plants called simple cycle turbines that do pollute a little bit more than combined cycle. Um, that plant in Goldendale is a combined cycle plant. And it tends to be uh, less emissions than what's called simple cycle turbines. Um, well, they have scrubber but, systems they can put on all those facilities now. Well, coal hey, and I, I, natural you can't, gas. You can't, you can't scrub CO2. And that's really what seems to be driving this uh, push for renewables. Well, that's the trouble with solar. It's dirtier than all the others. From cradle to grave, it's dirtier than any other facility, any other type of so energy. All the fossil fuels and everything that's used to create everything to get to that solar panel, and then no way to recycle them or, re or dispose of them. So they become an environmental impact 20 years from now when they're no longer usable. Like the warehouse full of solar panels over in Arlington that they don't know what to, how to dispose of. I don't, I don't know anything about Or where in Germany and these other countries already say no more solar because it's too detrimental to the environment and it's inefficient, doesn't do anything to supply constant electricity to the grid. Solar is only 1.3% of the total electricity put in the grid. And it's intermittent, unreliable, and it drives the cost of our energy up. So why do we want it? It's only because of the Department of Energy subsidizes with tax subsidies our tax money to keep your, your businesses going, wind and solar. Billions of dollars spent for you guys. What do we get out of it? How many full-time jobs? How much electricity from these facilities go right here to Goldendale or to Click Attack County? Lund Hill, 100% of that goes to Seattle. PSC already bought all that electricity. How does our county benefit from you being here? I can answer that question. How many full-time jobs? <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I mean, we've... Don't you cross-train the wind turbine people? To come and work on the solar farm, so you're not really creating any new jobs. Well, we hope we hope that there will be uh, permanent jobs, right? Just the fact that you've got uh, new facilities, but we'll have up to you know two or three people for this project, right? Lund Hill might have one for every three. 50 megawatts, according I, to one of your own representatives. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. Yeah. Uh, you talk about the security bonds. Will the security bonds for Bluebird be put up in advance before construction starts for decommissioning? Yeah. Here's the Lund Hill project, and it says, please note that no later than seven years after the project commences commercial operation, that's when you decide to put up a security bond. So if you leave the project before seven years, our county is stuck with the cleanup cost. Um, I I think Dan Would Christop you like to see Dan your own document right the, from a uh, man named Brian Walsh? Yeah, we work with Brian. So it sounds like, sounds like the county commissioners decided on this. But what? that's not, we can talk about the Lund Hill project. Well, right. So what about this one? It hasn't hit the county commissioner. Let, let me share this. Well, I'm right. asking him. I mean, will you have millions of dollars put aside in a security bond for cleanup? Considering solar panels are considered e-waste, and they have no way to recycle them currently. Yeah, I mean that will be part of the permitting process, and that will be part of the decision and permit associated with this project. And but one thing I want to do share, just sort of a factual piece here that I hopefully will is helpful, and that is. We will not build a project unless we have a power purchase agreement with a creditworthy counterparty before we start construction. So that said, you know, I'd like to think, right, that you're going to, these PPAs go from 10 years to like 25 years in, in term, that this project is not going to be decommissioned, right? It's not going to, to fail. And if it was to, let's just say, for whatever reason, Auburn Grid made a bad decision and uh, we, the, the project was uneconomic. Well, guess what? Someone's going to come in, buy the project, and continue operating it 
and selling it, selling the output. That's not always true. A bound Tell, solar I, I, didn't happen for them in Longmont, Colorado, Sagan. where they walked a bound solar. Longmont, Colorado, that's where they walked away from the project and left the citizens with the cleanup. I'm not it aware of that. happens quite often with bankruptcies and, and energy companies like this. Well, let me ask you this then. Obviously, you don't have a security bond in place for that. What about the technical advisory board that's supposed to be set up before the plan is approved? That's part of the conditions of approval in the FEIS on Lund Hill. Has that ever been set up? Where it's a board of citizens that help advise and, and look at what's going on? I Never heard of that? I'm aware of the Technical Advisory Council as it relates to the wind projects. I can look into Lund Hill to see what the condition is for the creation of a TAC, and I can get back to you on that. Well, that was all supposed to be set up prior to Lund Hill getting approved. Apparently, it wasn't done. I can, I can check into what was in the Lund Hill FEIS and the conditions of approval and get back to you on what what, the, what was required for attack and what has happened since. And here's a document that's from Lund Hill Solar Energy Project, conditions of approval. Okay. And many of these storm water pollution prevention plan, storm water plan, geotechnical report, road impact assessment, road haul agreement, construction traffic management plan, approach reports, decommissioning plan, all of these were says, the following conditions mu must be met prior to assuance of building permits and or performance of any land disturbing activities within the solar facilities. Those were all supposed to be done prior to Lund Hill getting a permit, yet many of them were done a year after the Lund Hill was permitted. Is that how Bluebird will be handled? I am not. Where it's all been okay. afterwards to be decided later? Sure. I am. Uh, the county will make the decision as to what the permit requirements are. And if there are permit requirements that require compliance before building permit issuance or a different permit issuance from the county, it is the county's discretion as to whether or not those are met. To my knowledge, all of the prior pre-construction conditions were met, which is why our building permit was issued. Or Lund Hill. Or Lund Hill. I no, can't that's speak, not what it says I here in your own documents. I did most of the filings. Um, so I, I can confirm that documents were sent to the county. Um, so I'm not too sure what document that you're reading from that, that suggests that we said that they weren't included to the county as part of pre-construction compliance. Road hall filing. agreement impact plans were finalized July 29th of 2020. Lund Hill was permitted August of 2019. Correct. That's a pre-construction filing. So that's filing. almost a year later. Correct. Before and that's just one of many studies that were done a year after the plan was approved. Correct. After the permit is approved, there are pre-construction filings that need to be submitted. But it was all supposed to be done prior to the permitting. They're done prior to the building permit issuance. Yes, and some, and some were prior to breaking ground. It, it was dependent upon which compliance condition it was. But if I had to take a guess as to what the county would be doing for Bluebird, um, this would be the sixth, I think, project that we would have permitted through the county. Um, and unless the county changes how they permit projects, I would make an assumption that they would have pre-compliance filings as well associated with the Bluebird project that we would need to comply with in order to receive our building permit and break ground. Well, the pattern of behavior from Lund Hill Looks like you'll do the same thing at Bluebird. I mean, you had uh, impact studies done from the Fish and Wildlife, Michael Ritter, and he submitted about five pages and basically ignored him. Nothing was ever done to satisfy the problems that he talked about. We conducted wildlife surveys, and we have a mitigation package that was endorsed by Klickitat County that we have fulfilled. But when the solar farm, solar facility comes there and it impacts the wildlife, you just can't give them money and that doesn't correct the problem. The problem is still there. I guess I, I don't know what problem you're referring to. Well, he talked about migration and all different kind of things of, about the fish and wildlife concerns. So you give them some money, but that doesn't change the problem. It doesn't fix it. 
The so, solar facility is still in the way. So the way that you mitigate for impacts in Washington state is through habitat. So you, it, you mitigate for habitat impacts and, and for the Lund Hill project, and I would assume would be true for the Bluebird project, habitat impacts were mitigated. All right, thanks. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Did anyone else have any additional questions or comments? I saw that we got one or two more people who joined us. All right, hearing none. Thank you so much for taking the time this evening to join us for our community meeting to learn more about the Bluebird Solar Project. If you want to submit questions or comments after today, uh, you can contact Ken Nichols here directly. His information is up on the screen, but for our folks joining us uh, via web and online, I'll just read it out real quick. Ken Nichols at avangrid.com. That's K-E-N dot I-N-C-H-O-L-S at avangrid.com or you may also reach him via phone at 971-978-9053. Again, that's 971-978-9053. I apologize, folks. The number that is up on the, uh, on the screen is correct. I apologize for that. So the number is 971-978-8053. Again, that is 971-978-8053. I do apologize for the confusion. That does conclude our community meeting. Would you mind coming up to the microphone, sir? Earlier you said Avangrid built a substation. Did you not buy it from Iberdrola? Down there? Yes. I'm going to restate this okay. for the people online. So Avangrid is a newly formed, publicly traded company uh, within Iberdrola. It's a subsidiary of. Does that help? We're all part of the same. And then just to uh, hammer home the point on public comments, this is not a county meeting. This is an Avangrid meeting. So all of the great comments that you just had please submit them formally to the county once scoping open when scoping opens it only helps create a better deis so i can't stress enough public comments as soon as the county deems us complete and has issued the notice of preparation they will open up a scoping period please submit comments um, to that it, it, it greatly helps inform the deis thank you Kristen. so that does conclude our community meeting Thank you for joining us and have a pleasant night.